Lord, how shall I make a video? The Lord says, just fucking make it. Sorry. He's right. Just do it. Like some bastards once said. I don't know if they even said it. Are any companies not owned by this organization? I think a great way to bring down the controllers is to stop spending. Stop participating. But that's not what this video is about. Thanks for being here. And welcome. I want to start out with an Emily Suzanne video. It's still not what the video is about, but I think it's a great place to start. She did some boots on the ground at a cement kiln, the Copley, Pennsylvania cement kilns. Cement, lime, coke, whatever they want to call these kilns. Ovens, essentially. Ovens, let's be clear. Old S ovens. Sir, I've asked you to build an oven. What is this? Oh, sorry. I thought I would build some castles. Some castle ovens. Well, it's a little more than we need, but they are beautiful. So yeah, I've never seen these ovens. I've never even seen an oven like this before. It was one thing to see 200 domes out in the middle of the desert, Utah, just poking out of the mud. But this... How could you even call these ovens? And whatever they are. Built from 1892 to 1893. Whatever. Again, I could live in one of these. And so could you. If you were just thinking about the necessities of life. They look more like lighthouses. I just don't know what they look like, actually. They don't look like anything I've seen. And they certainly don't look like ovens. They've clearly been patched up many times. A lot of these archways have been bricked up. And there's so much stuff we can focus on. I mean, in this field of research. Search. There's the notion that they were built in a year, first of all. Even one would be impressive to build in a year, but eight or nine? Then there's the condition of the brick. So much going on. So many different stages and damage. We see trees sprouting out of the top of the tower all over, really. And again, Emily Suzanne visited this firsthand, telling us all the details of the history of these kilns, built in one year. The kilns were said to be constructed from local brick and are known as chauffeur vertical kilns. Chauffeur, if you chauffe something in French, you're heating it, chauffe. They were shut down in 1904, according to history. So built in a year, shut down after 11 years. Then they were donated to Lee County in 1975. Big gap there. Big, big gap. 75 years later. Oh, what should we do with these? Come on, just donate them. And they created a cement industry museum out of them. And in 1980 was finally appreciated and added to the National Register of historic places. Just completely backwards. So here we go. Of course I know nothing, but I have no shame in asking questions. Were these really built in one year? Were they really ever intended to be cement-making ovens? Are we even seeing the whole structure? Or is this just the top? And clearly see more goes down underground. And lastly, what the hell happened to this brick? I mean, this brick is turning into sandstone. So cooked. And just in random places. Not even around where the heat should be. And it might be a good case to study melted brick. The in-between stage is where we can discover the most. In between brick and rock. But I'm not going to use this as an example. I just wanted to share this place with you. Let me know if you've seen any structures that look like this anywhere in the world. Or ovens. In the center of our realm, to the north, wherever you are, there is said to be a black rock, a magnetic black rock, so strong that it will rip nails out of wooden ships that approach. It is quite possible that this landmass in the north is where we come from. 
here I was watching another video by a Catherine Gregory, I think that's her name, forgive me, and these Native American ruins. The Native Americans will tell you they didn't build these structures. They're from a past people. That's all there is to it. They'll tell you. Some call them the Anasazi. Just the old people. The Navajo say that these people were kind of evil or had been corrupted, similar to our culture today. And here's a picture I screenshotted from our melted reality. And he does a great job of finding bricks that are turning to stone. Just that in-between sweet spot I'm talking about. Here's one example. Here's another example. Here you can see the brick lines. Brick line, brick line. Now fused into a blob. Just like bread. Just like rolls. And of course the melted mountain in San Francisco shows this as well. One more quick look. The bricks sandwich into the mountain. I mean, it becomes clear, right? Unless you're unwilling to really consider what you're seeing here. Recently, I will have shared this lime kiln, or what's left of it, in Nevada. This little fence around it. And this really got me interested, again, in my backyard. I think wherever we live, we get kind of jaded, and everything becomes ordinary. We see things like this in nature. And I decided to go down south to a national park. The national park is called Arches. And I'm going to show you what I experienced here. And I wasn't looking for arches. I was looking for evidence. And we'll have a look at that now. So I'm concerned with the various stages again. This condition, for example, is actually in great condition. Why? Because we have these pockets of preservation or survival. Here we see a window, here window, here one behind the arch, porch, a shelf, which I'll show you Chief and I walking along, a nice big sidewalk, much larger than this one. But we see the blockage, we even see the hue of red brick, we see the brick lines back here, and the more it's heated, the more it fuses and goes blob, turns into what we call rock or mountain. This is an example that I look forward to exploring very soon, very, very soon. This is in New Mexico, Bandelier National Monument. And here again, this is in really good shape because we still see windows, we still have inner cavities you can explore, and not something, in my opinion, that was carved by Native Americans. This is not carvable, not with primitive tools. A lot to say about this picture, but I'll move on to Sodom and Gomorrah in the Holy Land. And this is where it gets interesting. This really resembling the southwest of North America, very Utah, and really everywhere the Badlands. This can be found all throughout the realm. Examples like this. The difference is we have a biblical story that this was a city. City of Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, like the Native Americans speak of their ancestors or predecessors, the Anasazi, being evil and worldly and essentially wiping themselves out through wars. We have the same thing happening here. Except we're told God wipes out this city because they were so evil and whatever. But we have a story. We have a story that this was a city. That's my point. And you can really see the city, especially as a student of Maltology. You begin to see the towers, the building just brought down, cooked, and out here turned into powder. Really, this is a bad example, except we have the story. And this is a great example in Turkey. Turkey has a lot of good examples. And here we can see something very advanced at one point, now turned into a blobus rocky mountain, spilling over the corner of this once what must have been a beautiful building. And again, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, some of the best examples can be found in Petra, in Jordan. Here we can see the same thing. 
Section, section, section. Cooked out, almost having a Native American feel, similar to what we saw at Bandelier National Monument, but much more preserved. All of this above will have been the same thing, but this was all spared. We see it continues, and again we're told this is primitive, very similar to the Native American story, that natives carved this, in this case goat herders, only to abandon it. But when you have eyes to see, you realize that this is a one, two, two, three, four, five, perhaps six story building. And that's just what we see in worse condition at the top. And now we're going to look at some Utah and we're going to see these same sections, but in really bad condition. Perhaps before I get into it, I should read you the story. The story on how all these formations were created. Again, I'm proposing that all of these were structures that have been turned into this blobbish state through an extreme cataclysmic event, perhaps within an hour. But I wanted to show you what history or mainstream geology has to say about this. So here we go. Let's just look at this picture before we even read any of their BS. Here we go. How do these arches form in Utah? This is going to be their explanation. And look at how we start out with example number one. So that's it. And the truth is, yes. I mean, they're not going to say it's the truth, but yes. Right at the beginning, we do see blockage formations square and intelligent so they tell us the park sits on an underground salt bed and it's responsible for all this thousands of feet thick the salt was deposited 300 million years ago just stupid when the sea flowed into the region and eventually evaporated over millions of more years from floods winds debris was compressed as rock a mile thick on top of the salt. So this doesn't even make sense. The debris was compressed from the water. Why didn't it just compress in a big chunk? Why these perfect blocks? Well, they need these perfect blocks to fit with their story as to how water is going to get in here and shape it like a piece of clay. And whatever, you can read this, it makes me sick, but here it is. And I should start at the beginning, but I just want to show you one little example. Does this look like it took millions of years, or does this look like it just got hot and melted like putty? It seems pretty clear that this has melted. This has nothing to do with the story they're telling us. This is what my eggs look like after I go collect them. Pretty muddy. Here we could see what I think some people would call cart ruts all over. And my impressions of this park was kind of a mixed basket. In one way, it was also beautiful, and I was seeing it as a tourist. And in another sense, I was seeing it as a graveyard. The same things we see in Turkey, but again in worse condition. The separate sections have been heated so much more so than in Turkey that it's almost unrecognizable. However, lots of areas in this park are off limits, and I could see evidence of caves and what look like windows, even here. Window, 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 just completely pancaked. Again, a row of windows above it, even in worse condition. But yet we can access a lot of this, if we were allowed. And just like we see in Jordan, in Petra, the top is in worse condition than the middle. And oftentimes the bottom is in really rough condition too. Here at Arches National Park, we see the blockage on the bottom third still being in pretty good shape as you can see a little bit of here and here as well you see the bottom has stayed block but up top here has fused into solid block still seeing the lines the windows that have now become little slits still seeing grand archways that have filled in with hot melted debris and i think to most people this would be unrecognizable 
and I think that's why they made it a park. Again, making other parts off limits. And if it is recognizable, again, they'll put a little wooden ladder next to one of the window openings and tell us it's Native American. They do it all the time. The evidence is all around us. But if you package a story and claim to be an expert, the brain kind of shuts down. At least at first. And we see the difference, sometimes red blobs and sometimes pure white ones, as we see here. And here again, structures. It's similar to the Grand Canyon, the way they want to tell us that water, similar to this place, that water essentially washed this rock away to make these shapes. But I want you to look at this arch here. Look at how square this is. This is not the result of millions of years of water slowly, softly wearing away at the grains of sand. No, this is all sharp. And same with the Grand Canyon. Look at the direction the water flows and then look at those canyon walls. They're not smooth and soft. And it's the same with this place. And see, I'm just reviewing this photo now for the first time. And I realize there's a little access here. So you can see most of the windows have blobbed over and we have a little opening. This was the Devil's Garden Campground. There's also a beautiful Devil's Garden in Colorado. Here you can see the moon. And I woke up super early, which is perfect. This is the best hour, similar to sunset, for shooting pictures. And it's just a really sacred time, in general. Chief and I walked out on this ridge, way out here. And he knew how early it was. He was like, what are we doing up here? But it was really interesting to get this perspective. Somebody recently proposed that our feelings are an action, that we are making our feelings and not a victim of them. And I get this. There was a point where perhaps I had overly mourned and I began to realize it was affecting my health, possibly those around me. I feel like this, I feel like that. It is you doing. And as difficult as it is to accept, it is something that we're in control of. I found these trips, a trip anywhere, even to a truck stop, brought joy to my soul. It always has. And so I've decided to begin taking more trips. This was just one of many. I want to thank my Patreons. I thank you if you've watched this far. I think I've said a lot. And in all fairness, I'll end with the mainstream narrative that I skipped over very dismissively. As always, I don't know. These are just my thoughts. And if I knew everything, I might have nothing to say. So they begin. Water and ice, extreme temperatures and underground salt movement are responsible for the sculpted rock scenery of Arches National Park. On clear blue sky days, it's difficult to imagine such violent forces or the hundred million years of erosion that created this land, boasting one of the world's greatest densities of natural arches. Over 2,000 cataloged arches range in size from a three-foot opening to the longest measuring 306 feet base to base. Towering spires, pinnacles, and balanced rocks perched atop seemingly inadequate bases vie with the arches as scenic spectacles. Sorry, I think this is poorly written. New features are being formed as old ones are destroyed. Erosion and weathering work slowly but relentlessly, creating dynamic landforms that gradually change through time. Change sometimes occurs more dramatically. In 1991, a rock slab 60 feet long, 11 feet wide, and 4 feet thick fell from the underside of Landscape Arch, leaving behind an even thinner ribbon of rock. Archaic people, and later ancestral Puebloan, Fremont, and Utes, searched the arid desert for animals and wild plants for food and stone for tools and weapons. Some of their pictographs and petroglyph panels remain today. Hopi, Paiute, Navajo, Ute, and Zuni people remain connected to this landscape. I didn't see one native. 
Probably because the fee to get in is $30. The first non-native explorers came looking for minerals. Ranchers found grasses for cattle and sheep. Disabled Civil War veteran John Wesley Wolfe and his son Fred settled here in the late 1800s. A weathered log cabin, root cellar, and corral are evidence of the primitive ranch they operated for over 20 years. A visit to the Wolf Ranch is a walk into the past. More on the formations, they tell us, they stand like a layer of cake over most of the park. Over time, water seeped into cracks, joints, and folds. Ice formed in the fissures, expanding and pressuring the rock, breaking off bits and pieces. Wind later cleaned out the cavities. Many of these finally collapsed. So there we go. This is all I have to say. A little look at a place I've never been, my thoughts, and their thoughts. So I thank you for joining me. I thank everyone that supports. I love you all. God bless. And I'll see you next week.